Welcome to the MOOC on Pacific Studies offered by the University of the South Pacific. My name is Frank Thomas, Senior Lecturer in Pacific Studies at the Oceania Center for Arts, Culture, and Pacific Studies. I am your presenter for this session, which will serve as an introduction to the field of Pacific Studies. In this course, we will journey across the Pacific Islands, also known as Oceania, and explore a selection of topics relevant to the region, and hope that our international audience will get to know us better. This is the first of five modules and serves as an introduction to the field of Pacific Studies. At the end of this session, you will be able to compare and contrast the rationales for Pacific Studies, demonstrate an understanding of the differences between indigenous specific and Western knowledge systems, and reflect on Pacific scholars' understandings of Pacific Studies. The Pacific Islands, also referred to as Oceania, and comprising the three culture areas of Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia, have captured the imagination of several generations of travelers and scholars. With over 40,000 years of human settlement in the region's western part, the islands display enormous cultural diversity. Pacific Islanders speak a quarter of the world's languages, but some communities of speakers are fast disappearing as a result of culture contact with larger ethnic groups and the adoption of more universal languages such as English, French, and Melanesian pigeons after more than 200 years of interaction with Europeans and other cultures. Pacific Studies aims to understand indigenous cultures from an insider's point of view, without dismissing out of hand the contributions of others who have studied and described the region. Thus, Pacific Studies is primarily about Pacific Islanders' view how they view themselves in a rapidly globalizing world, and how local traditions, beliefs, and knowledge systems can continue to be relevant. Pacific Studies is also about understanding the commonalities that underline cultural and linguistic diversity. As the late Professor Epeli Hawofa argued, the ocean contributes one of the most enduring and powerful symbols of the region's identity binding a host of cultures despite the imposition of colonialism, including political and economic barriers to the free flow of people and ideas. Finally, Pacific Studies is about integrating various disciplinary approaches, such as history or anthropology, with the ways Pacific Islanders conceptualize their world. The Pacific Islands were colonized by European powers relatively late in global terms. They were also among the last to be decolonized, although some political dependencies remain. Decolonization ended direct control of island entities by outside powers, but did not restore the, to Pacific Islanders the level of control over their lives that had existed before colonization. Interestingly, political power was restored to colonized people just when the significance of the sovereign nation-state was declining in the face of unprecedented levels of global interdependence. As a result of intense political and economic transformations, large numbers of Pacific Island people have moved away from their home islands to settle beyond the region. There are also large communities of Pacific peoples living on other islands that, were not, that they are not indigenous from, creating further cultural diversity and sometimes tension in an already complex region. Emerging from America's desire to better understand and administer newly acquired territories in Micronesia after Japan's defeat in World War II, Pacific Studies was first established at the University of Hawaii. Since then, a host of institutions throughout the world have developed their own academic programs, including the University of the South Pacific. Although a relatively recent field of study, Pacific Studies has matured as a discipline. Scholars and practitioners have posed a series of interrelated questions to help define its possible future. 
These questions are highlighted in the above bullet point and those that follow below. Some 20 years ago, Terence Wesley Smith of the Center for Pacific Studies at the University of Hawaii articulated three rationales for tertiary level Pacific Studies programs and their implications for curriculum design and development. As noted earlier, the pragmatic rationale in the United States was directly linked to America consolidating its position as a superpower at the end of the Second World War. Having been entrusted by the United Nations with the administration of the former Japanese territories in Micronesia, the Marianas, the Caroline Isles, now the Federated States of Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands, the U.S. military enlisted the support of linguists and anthropologists to train personnel in appropriate skills against the background of the struggle between capitalism and communism ideologies and their influence on developing nations in the new era of the Cold War. Thus, specific studies took its place in the emerging field of area studies, defined in geographical terms with attendant assumptions about researchers' ability to understand the totality of a region's societies by the study of certain essential characteristics. With the area as the main unit of analysis, a range of academic disciplines largely working independently of each other constructed a body of knowledge still dominated by Western conceptual or theoretical frameworks. These multidisciplinary approaches paid little attention to integrating their findings to create a new body of knowledge, indigenous knowledge systems being largely marginalized. The pragmatic rationales took hold at other institutions in Australia and New Zealand, with the former focusing on Melanesia, particularly Papua New Guinea, and the latter on the Polynesian islands sharing colonial ties. With the release of MacArthur and Wilson's 1967 treaties of island biogeography, archaeologists began to investigate the applicability of biogeographical principles to the study of cultural processes on islands. However, the concept of islands as laboratories was explored even earlier by anthropologists. Although environmental degradation and the assault on cultural expressions by the advent of modernity are not limited to islands, the latter are commonly seen as more vulnerable to disturbance compared to continental areas. This is especially true in the case of oceanic island ecosystems where relative isolation has often resulted in high rates of endemicity and the loss of defensive mechanisms among both plants and animals. When isolation is broken, dramatic changes often follow. Admitting that humans show more flexible survival strategies to cope with outside pressures than most other organisms, island societies have also suffered physically and psychologically. For example, the well-recorded epidemics of the second half of the 19th and early 20th centuries bear testimony to the ve devastating consequences of cultural contact, reinforcing the concept of isolation from an epidemiological point of view. But isolation is a relative concept. Near complete isolation of human communities appears to have been more an exception than the norm, bearing in mind that isolation can also develop from deliberate social strategies. The application of archaeometric techniques to document the movement of commodities, for example, pottery, fine-grained basalt, obsidian, complements more traditional approaches to studying interaction, such as linguistic in relationships, oral histories, material culture, and architectural styles. Sustained contacts between communities would confer advantages in the event of persistent demographic instability and shortages in food or raw materials caused by environmental stresses. As with the pragmatic rationale, the laboratory rationale remains disciplinary bound, thereby negating the potential contribution of an interdisciplinary approach to Pacific scholarship. To quote Wesley Smith again, 
It is influenced by the seminal work of French philosopher Michel Foucault. Scholars and students throughout the social sciences and humanities are considering or reconsidering the epistemological foundations of their disciplines. The third rationale discussed by Wesley Smith, empowerment, aims to distance itself from the colonial and neo-colonial agendas associated with the two previous approaches by emphasizing understanding. The rise of indigenous scholarship in the region, paralleling indigenous scholarship in other parts of the world, accompanied political independence and the further need to decolonize the mind reclaim space for indigenous knowledge, and develop and apply more culturally relevant approaches, most notably in the field of Pacific education. This has wide-ranging consequences in terms of providing more room for indigenous voices, perspectives, and experiences. Some scholars believe that in order to fully achieve those goals, Pacific Islanders themselves need to take full control of a curriculum and research agenda long dominated by outsiders. This translates into a more in-depth understanding and critical application of indigenous bodies of knowledge or epistemological frameworks to more effectively serve the interests of Pacific communities in the Pacific Islands and overseas. Knowledge can be defined as a bundle of information that is used to understand the world we live in. What defines true from false knowledge is a question of reliability. Knowledge can be assessed through argument by authority because it is so. For example, from parent to child, chief to commoner, or religious authority. Knowledge can also be looked at critically by way of epistemology, or the branch of philosophy that studies knowledge. Western epistemology is often described as fundamentally different from Pacific epistemology. In its essential form, the universalistic character of Western thought argues that there is no distinction between perception and interpretation. By contrast, among Pacific cultures, knowledge appears to be grounded in a particular place. The Greek philosophy Plato argued that knowledge is merely an awareness, a universal idea existing independent of any subject trying to apprehend it. Aristotle, another Greek philosopher, while still accepting that knowledge is an apprehension of necessary and universal principles, stress the logical and empirical methods of gathering such knowledge. The Renaissance in Europe gave rise to two epistemological positions. Empiricism, which sees knowledge as a product of sensory perceptions, and rationalism, which sees knowledge as the product of rational reflection. The experimental sciences, which are grounded in empiricism, led to a view still explicitly or implicitly held by many people that knowledge results from a reflection of external objects through our sensory organs to our brain or mind. Knowledge is said to be absolute and can be grasped by observation. Immanuel Kant, an 18th century German philosopher, attempted to synthesize empiricism and rationalism. He argued that knowledge is the organization of perceptual data on the basis of inborn cognitive structures or categories such as space, time, objects, and causality. While these categories are regarded as given or static, Kant's epistemology accepts their subjectivity. The early 20th century anthropologist Bronislaw Malinowski who conducted fieldwork in the Trobrian Islands of Southeast New Guinea, advocated what may be called a relativistic view of culture and therefore knowledge. In Argonauts of the Western Pacific, published in 1922, Malinowski states that the key is for the observer to discover the 
subjective desire, not a scientific one, to discover, discover for himself or herself the substance of the Trobriander's happiness. Th the deeper the contact, the more complete the self-exposure, precisely because it is ultimately dependent on individual interpretation, what Malinowski called subjective desire. In conclusion, Pacific Studies aims to explore some of the ways Pacific Islanders experience their world, bearing in mind that there are multiple and hybrid epistemologies, sometimes in conflict with one another. As a result of more than two centuries of exposures to outside influence and the current forces of globalization. Arjun Apadurai, a contemporary anthropologist focusing on modernity and globalization, recognizes that knowledge is an amalgamation of reality and imagination. Additional resources have been included in this presentation.